our guest this evening is the intriguing Scott Tepperman. Many of you may know Scott from the hit TV show Ghost Hunters International. Scott appeared from 2008 through 2012. Many will know Scott from his many movies and videos. See, working alongside fellow friend Jim O'Rear, they formed Los Bastards Productions. They've written, directed, produced, and acted in some great notable horror movies such as Camp Massacre, Hell's Bells, Cruel Summers Part 1 and 2, with Part 2 just being released. Scott also appeared in other films such as I Dared You, Truth or Dare 5, Night of the Living Dead, Genesis, Don't Look in the Basement 2, and The Hospital Parts 1 and 2. Scott has worked on and starred in Magnetic Highway and the sequel Magnetic Highway Exit 2, which talks about video stores and their recent resurgence. Scott is also a writer, having written two theme books, Overlooked and Underrated 1 and 2, which includes 200 horror video classics, some of which have been forgotten. So did I leave anything out? Oh yeah, Scott's also a family man, having married the beautiful Kim and his lovely daughter Ashley. And let me not forget, my wife Jen and I have known Scott way back to 2013, where we met him at a Paracon and have remained friends for 10 years so far. So, here's Scott Tepperman. Okay. And Careful stairs. Oops. Scott and I are investigating the uh, third floor mezzanine area where the client had told us that the man was repairing a light and had seen an apparition and then looked back and he was gone. And then having his leg pulled. I don't see anybody in the seats. Who's that? I don't know. I heard that. I hear somebody. You hear like footsteps. Um, you hearing that? I keep hearing it. It sounds like it's behind you in that area. Yeah, it is. It's. I think it's kind of like right around here. How was that? Point seven. Is there anybody here? Don't be alarmed. My name is Joe. This is my friend Scott. Readings are high. Just. As a base, they're high. That thing's freaking out. Police in your Tapia, would you let us see you? Point six. Do you like to play practical jokes? You could scare one of us. If you scare me enough, I'll probably pee a little. <laughs> He's gonna EVP in his pants. Yeah. Holy <laughs> What the was what? Okay, go, 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 go. Jim and Scott have become so close working together, they're naming their follow-up movie Blank Blade. Twin. Twin Blade. Ooh. Well, that's not oh, bad. That's not bad. <laughs> that's not what I would have said, but that's not bad. Put that in the back of your face, though. Okay. So what did you say? I said swing. Swing Blade. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That was good. That was good. All right, Jim. You're going to see all these titles. Of course, my, <laughs> my mind immediately always goes to the gutters. It's Penis Blade. <laughs> My nickname, actually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, and the card that I wrote earlier works, and it goes because yeah. if we're together. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also put this. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. You know, we have to be very PC, well, yeah. so we're, we're good. <laughs> That's why I bring a lot of cards, because I use them all, so. <laughs> so before I get thrown off the air, we're not going to even ask you what those cards, other cards said. <laughs> So how you doing, Scott? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad I got on. I, I can't stand yeah. these uh, these things. I, I I don't. I always have a problem when I have to do one of these. Uh, now you understand why with my email. I said usually like a half hour before. To... I've been was... down this route a number of times. So yeah, I was actually um... out, and and I'm glad we got back in time. I was like, we gotta yeah. get home. So, I'm glad yeah, you got I'm back excited. in time too. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I've had incidents where people didn't show up. So yes, I'm. <laughs> I'm very happy that you showed up. Um, cool. First off, I want to say to everyone that's listening, thanks for coming back. Um, as you probably know, I've moved closer to you now. Mm -hmm. I actually figured out it was two and a half hours away from you. So we okay. have no excuse not to get together for dinner about halfway in between. Sure. 
So, That'll work. Um, but yeah, we moved and we sort of put the show on hold for a bit um, till we came back. But we are back, and I thank everyone who's listening, no matter how they're listening to us, for coming to us. Now, <clears throat> I promised you that I was not going to hit too much on GHI. Okay. No, you can totally do that. That's I know, fine, but Scott but today is, awesome. is, to me, Scott today is known for Los Bastards Productions. He's the actor, the producer, the director. But you're building that name. So I, I want to go back just for those who looked and said, Hey, that's Scott Tepperman. Don't we know him from Paranormal? So, yeah, we do. Um, let our listeners know how you went from this guy living in Flushing, Queens, because we talked about this, okay, in New York, to being on an international paranormal show. Um, I mean, it was, it was literally luck. I, I moved here. Uh, I'm in Tallahassee, Florida, and I moved here. Um, my my family's in West Palm Beach. I was, you know, born and raised in uh, Queens, New York. And um, my family's in Queens. Well, I'm in Queens, in uh, West Palm. My mom's down there. And um, when I graduated high school, I went up to, uh, went to Long Island to go to college and um, blew all the money I had. I didn't have much. It blew all that I had because Long Island, most expensive place, ended up back and I was in West Palm Beach with my mom for a while. And then... Um, I ended up moving to Tallahassee in 2003 or 2004. And because um, uh, there was nothing to do up there. But I, I, I started hearing that there was stuff about um, paranormal. There was a paranormal ghost hunting team at that time. I didn't even know that that stuff existed. And, you know, un unlike a lot of people that had experiences when they were younger, I never did at all. It's just like there's something to do that sounds interesting. Let me check it out. So I um, hit up this paranormal group, started going on investigations with them. Uh, soon, not too long after I joined them, I, I ended up becoming their lead investigator. And they actually had a pretty, they, they had been around for years and um, they had a pretty big following. Um, but then I started realizing after they, you know, schooled me, if you will, I learned all this stuff and everything else. And I started realizing that, um, I didn't really like the way they were doing things. Let's put it that way. And so I uh, went to form my own team and took a couple of people from the uh, the group I was in, and we, we formed my ghost team at that time. Short-lived. We maybe lasted a year, but um, one of the people that I joined, that I formed a new team with, um, he asked if if uh, GHI literally had a casting call online. And they said, hey, if, you know, whatever. And he asked if we wanted to do that. And I said, no, because... When I, I used to like Ghost Hunters anyway, uh, when it first came out, the first one. And um, I really wanted to get on a show. I'm like, okay. And they had contests. They had where one was like, uh, you know, do you have what it takes, whatever. It was something like you can win this, you know, box of equipment and then you can end up on a show and investigate with the guys or for one episode or something. I was like, oh, that's cool. So I, um, I, we like, I put like a bio together and a folder and like a, a demo reel of me doing like carry out like stupid shit, like, stupid, man, like <laughs> but everything and um, never even heard back. This was from the first ghost hunters and, and I'm sure they got millions of millions of uh, entries. So, you know, it is what it is, but then they had like, they had two or three over the years and I kept applying to these things. And I was going above and beyond and they never heard anything. So, uh, and it was heartbreaking because I really put everything into it. Like I went, oh, no, they're just probably asking for an audition. I'm going to do this or whatever. And um, so when GHI came along, when that offer came along, they were literally looking for a casting call for people. And I was just like, I'm not interested because I just don't want to put everything into it and get rejected again. Well, unbeknownst to me, that person submitted my stuff and um, they started calling me and talking to me and having a lot of interviews. The phone calls got longer and longer and longer. They brought me out to California to actually do a screen test. And it, what they did was there was places, I, uh, Preston Castle, I think it was Ione, California. It was a, a location that I think the production company for Ghost Hunters had already secured. And I guess they wrapped up their investigation because when I went there, I, didn't, I wasn't even associated with that show. It was GHI, but um, they had that same property locked down, I guess, for maybe another night or whatever. So they did a test thing. They brought me down and they had people with cameras following us around and they had gotten uh, Paul Bradford and Barry uh, Fitzgerald to, to show up and uh, 
and do, I guess, a mock investigation with me. And I just think they wanted to see how I reacted on camera and how I was uh, comfortable with that or how I reacted with the, interacted with the team. And um, I had, I mean, I'm certainly, if you see I'm that, that I act, I'm not really an actor. Over the years, I guess I've gotten better. But um, at that time, certainly no. But I did go to college for um, theater. And uh, I, I majored in English, but I was theatrical uh, minor was theater and, you know, I, I did take uh, improv classes and acting classes. So I had a little experience in front of camera and in, in front of people as well. And I, I that must have come across on the camera. I don't know, because I, I was very comfortable with it. I, you know, I didn't look in the camera and I didn't do anything. And, you know, to this day, I'll tell you that GHI, for my purposes, I mean, I was there two out of the three seasons and um, they never asked us to fake anything. They just tried to catch what we were doing. And if I'd come in and I'd mumble something, they'd say, you know, you did mumble. Can you go out and come back in and say it again? Um, but they never wanted us to investigate more an area more than once because they wanted genuine reactions. Um, they didn't fake anything. They didn't plan anything. That just that they just wanted us to. They just said make it interesting for us. Um, and so I guess I made it interesting enough that uh, I got on board. And um, I, I, they, I mean, literally, the the rest is history. I had a. Um, I was on a show. I was hired in 2009. I got on 2010. The show was canceled 2012. So I guess we went down with the ship, mm -hmm. so to speak. But um, at that time, I had an agent and I was doing a lot of conventions. A lot of the guys really weren't at that time. But I had been doing conventions prior to GHI because my local group, we were doing local conventions. And we were kind of rubbing elbows with the big wigs at that time because we, I hate to say that use a word but we were like nobodies we were just some random you know local low-end paranormal team but we were getting invited to like megacon and supercon and all these other places um and having booths right next to big celebrities um and i was a horror guy so sitting next to a lot of these guys or being associated with them in any way was an honor um and so i started got an agent he started getting us on board for for more things especially when ghi was on or just ending we were everyone was trying to book us. Um, and he had this guy named Jim O'Rear at the time, uh, also on his roster. And the first event I did that I met Jim O'Rear was 2012. And it was, uh, I think it was like the Queen Mary something. And I may, I may be mixing up certain guests because I, I think I was there several times, but it was Joe Chin, Susan Slaughter, myself, and it was some group, from, uh, some cast from like Friday the 13th, Adrian King, and some other people. And Jim was there. And nobody knew who Jim was. Uh, I did because I kind of watched that kind of crappy B movie <laughs> that I love. I mean, I love that stuff. So I knew who he was. He and I hit it off really well. And I said, if, you know, if you ever have anything um, available in the film, just give me a chance. I'll come down on my old di on my own dime. I'll put myself up. I just want a, a chance to to show you that that I can do what's required of of whatever you'll give me to me. And Jim said. Uh, give me about two weeks. He currently had another, he had a partner at the time, another business partner. He said, we're actually working on a horror film right now. Give me a couple of weeks and I'll be in contact with you. That could have been the big kiss off the big, yeah, don't call us. We'll mm -hmm. call you type thing. But um, literally probably within 10 days, he contacted me, made good on his promise and offered me a role that they specifically wrote for me in a movie called the hospital. And that movie be is it's still to this day it is, is one of our best, most popular films. Um, I was honored to be a part of that one, even for a small, uh, small little role, 10 minute, I think, screen time. But I was in the beginning, the middle and the end. So I kind of bookended the whole film, which is cool. <laughs> but then in the second film, I had a, a much bigger part and I was, oops, I dropped the phone oops. and I was, and I was, um, Show I was us the room the, later. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I was one of the, the, the producers on the hospital too. And Jim and I really started hitting off. And then when him and his, uh, then production partner decided to, part ways they wanted to take different avenues and explore different paths in uh, filmmaking. Um, Jim and I thought it was no brainer. We had great chemistry and people always said that. And we, we partnered up and we formed Los Bastards Productions in 2015. And we, you know, for operating on zero budget, whether people like them or not, we're, we're hammering out films and, you know, considering they're very, I mean, like non-existent budget, I think the quality is pretty good job. I think we do a good job with these films. Pretty much they get good reviews. They, they're well received by people. And we're lucky enough to, to have done, I think, you know, eight years into Los Bastards. And I think we've done as many films 
I think we've done eight films in eight years and it's just a, it's a blessing. And, and, you know, I still try to do the, the ghost hunting stuff when I can, but, um, there was, well, we're going to uh, go some, into the films. In yeah, there, well, there was some, I, you know, there was some stuff the you, other. If you remember, you saw yeah. the picture there mm -hmm. in the opening film there, because I saw you look during the time of the film there, like, what is that? Wait, wait, what's that picture? Okay. Right. That was when it was at one of the Mid South mm -hmm. conventions. Mm -hmm. And I remember the room, and I remember you were on one side, Jim was on mm -hmm. the other, mm -hmm. and Santiago Cirillo. That was the first day I met Santiago. Because I even told him during the interview, I heard this loud noise. I was like, what the heck was that? It was either you or Jim said, that's Santiago. Yeah, you know when he's in the building for sure. Yeah, he's oh, a good without guy. a doubt. Really <laughs> Before we get too far off the paranormal, mm -hmm. I, I always ask investigators this. What was the one thing that happened that you experienced that said, whoa, there's something else going on here? Yeah. So again, what I was saying earlier is the fact that um, most of the, one of the things, especially it's a GHI story, but what's mm -hmm. weird is, you know, when ghost hunters came out, they were a team already. They were a team in Rhode Island. I think they were called RIPS or Rhode Island Paranormal Society. Mm -hmm. They was, they were already existing as a cohesive ghost hunting unit. Um, and then it look, I, as far as I know, you know, I don't really have any of the inner workings of that, but they were offered a show that someone got hold of them and said, Hey, we like what you guys are doing. You're unique. You got good chemistry. You can have whatever. We'll give you a show. When they did GHI, we were all investigators, but we were handpicked. We didn't work together. We never knew each other. You know, we were there wasn't a GHI team. We weren't another team. We, I worked for my team. Someone else was on their team. Someone else was on their team. And they pieced us together to, to make us one team. So it was a little different to approach that way. But when we did GHI, and then again, a lot of these guys have had experiences when they were younger that made them get into the paranormal. I just thought it was cool. I'm like, let me check it out. Um, so I never had anything really uh, crazy happen. I had maybe one or two experiences, but nothing, you know, just you couldn't really explain them, but you weren't really overly obsessed about them. When I was with GHI, we had a few things. It was one in um, in Italy when Joe Chin, I'll never forget this, Joe Chin and I were investigating in, uh, it was... God, I think it was, I said, I can't, we'll never forget this. And I don't remember the place. I think it was like um, Frankenstein's castle or, or some Franken, something, some villa or whatever, where they wrote Frankenstein. I think that's what it was, Mary Shelley or something. And we were investigating the kitchen. We were probably in there 30 minutes or so. And Joe and, Joe and I were doing an EVP session and he was asking questions. He had the recorder running and I had the, I don't know if it was a Mel meter at the time, or whatever we were using. Um, and I was walking around trying to check the baseline reading. Um, and, you know, after you get in stuff for a while, you may start evoking some kind of response. So you try to get a baseline reading so you can, you know, gauge any kind of fluctuations as you're trying to strike a chord or whatever. And so that's what was going on. So I, we were walking around. I was doing the, the measurement and trying to check everything. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I checked into this one area and it was like a... Um, I think it was like a pantry uh, off off the side. It was a big kitchen we were in. And I remember Joe was standing near the stove uh, asking questions, pretty pretty stationary. And I kept going, um, walking around each corner, checking. I'd go into the pantry, check, and I went all over. I must have done it four or five times. The last time I went to check the pantry, I'd go in there, i open the door, go into the pantry, and um, I see uh, it was an apparition. It was a, it was a torso, um, and it was like a washer and dryer in the corner. And out of the top of it, it looked like there was a torso of a, of a person. I couldn't even tell. I don't remember enough if it was a man or a woman. But I couldn't tell the age. But it looked like they were facing the corner, almost Blair Witch style. Um, and I didn't know what the hell that was. It freaked me out. And uh, like, Joe, Joe, Joe. And this is actually on air. A lot of times this stuff doesn't make TV, mm -hmm. but this did. And, I remember uh, this on the air. <laughs> and, and Joe's like, you don't go ever, don't ever go on your own. Don't ever go anywhere on your own or whatever. But um, we came... Uh, I told him what happened, everything. We contacted the whole team. Everyone came in for that. And Paul, to his credit, you know, Paul gets a lot of crap from people, but he's a really good investigator. And he was like, okay, calm, he calmed everyone down. He's like, well, so what are we doing? You're experiencing this. You're seeing this. You're, you're whatever. He set up all this stuff to, to, to he like rigged something on the spot uh, to measure anything that would go on. And he had a very good explanation for what he did. 
um, that never made air. They kind of cut that. Cause once things get talky, they, they cut a lot of that stuff, unfortunately. Um, but he did do a good job on that. We never caught anything uh, tangible. But when we did re- do the reveal to the client, I think it was it was Barry and Chris at the time. And they were exp- they this was on the show, too. They um, I think they told the uh, the owner what I had experienced and the owner didn't even flinch. And, uh, and the owner, owner was said something like yeah, there used to be a doorway there or something. So whatever I saw was obviously some maybe some kind of a residual that was just going through their general movement that was headed towards in where there are times where there was a door and it was just crazy. And it kind of lent a lot of credibility in my mind to what I experienced. Um, insane. It was an unbelievable experience. And so that was the real physical thing, but you know, we've seen other things. We've heard things. We've seen shadows. We've seen whatever we were in a, uh, it was an underground prison. I think it was in Nicaragua. And I think it was with Joe. And he's my perma partner. You know, we switched up once in a while, but um, we went into this room and I, I mentioned something. I said, it feels like this room is breathing. It just felt like the walls were compressing, expanding, compressing, expanding. And I never get, I'm not any kind of weird sensitive. I don't, you know, get those weird, not weird sensitive. I don't get those weird feelings like sensitives mm-hmm. or anything. Um, and I think the story came out is that uh, years ago, uh, a man a priest or a whatever brought a little girl into that room and she was possessed or had something going on and he performed an exorcism and apparently whatever she expelled went into the walls. Um, so I, I didn't know that <laughs> until after the fact either. <laughs> so there's a few things that happened. The one thing I will point out that's interesting is, you know, we were all investigators and we always tried to approach stuff as, skeptics but you still want to not dismiss everything because you you won't have anything going on so skeptics but you know 50 percent skeptic 50 percent believer type thing um but you always want to discount your own stuff always your own control you want to control yourself have to have to yeah but but we had cast we had a not cast we had crew and the crew were basically hired guys you had hired videographers audio Mm -hmm. you know audio people and they weren't paranormal guys at all. It was just, hey, this is a job. This is a gig for us. We had those same guys over the years. And what was cool is they never believed that stuff. Because I remember early on, we'd be like, did you hear that? Like, we really would hear something. Did you hear that? And we'd catch the audio guys. So the camera guys like, you know, rolling their eyes, doing whatever. Over the years, they even said, they're like, okay, I'll tell you right now. I heard that in my mic. Or I heard that in my headphones. I saw that with my own eyes. That was not doctored. I don't know what that was. And they became believers. They started at least ex- understanding and um, appreciating what we were doing. Um, they had no answer for it, but we generally didn't either. You know, it, GHI was able to evolve from when it started. We had to always say, this place is haunted. This place is not haunted. That, that's just what they wanted. Nothing is black and white. So there, was, there were management changes over the years. There were cast changes over the years. And we started being able to really leave the door open to say, Hey, you know what? We don't know what this was, but when we were here with our 20 people walking in with cameras and mics and everything else, we experienced this, or we didn't experience this, you know, that Mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And so we were able to say, we were able to leave the door open for a lot of things that we were not sure. This one person we dealt with, we tried to use him as a vessel because he believed he was the, um, catalyst for stuff that was happening there. We had people that wanted to bring us in because they wanted us to say the place was haunted so they could use that as marketing and say, found haunted by GHI. We didn't do that. We didn't bite. We're like, no, that's not, but we're not saying it's not haunted. It just, nothing happened when we are here. or we're not saying it is haunted. We just, we can't explain this. You know, I tell a lot of people when they, when they say that, uh, they're envious because we got to go all over the world. I'm envious like Tim Miley and all that. I've told him this numerous times. I'm envious of the fact that a lot of you guys that investigate, you, you'll know what I'm talking about too. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you're local enough where you get to establish some kind of a relationship with the energy that's in a location. You're starting to get, hey, this seems much different than it did the last time I was here. We never had that. We got in, we did whatever, and we got out. You know, Tim was able to. It's the perfect example. He was able to. Um, really start piecing things together and developing relationships, not only with uh, certain 
uh, spiritual activity in a location, but with the family that was connected to that. And he was able to keep going back and expanding on that. I, I have a lot of respect for that. That's really cool. And a lot of these local paranormal guys do that. And, uh, you know, so, yes, we went to cool locations, some of them. But, yes, we went to cool locations. But we got in, we got out. There was really no real quality time. I mean, we went to France, and I couldn't tell you anything. We went to uh, a uh, um, an amusement park in France for one day. That was the whole thing we saw with, like, we get in, we get out. We tried to do one thing when we did have time off, but the quality wasn't there. And so the see. investigations in general, we, we two or three days in a location and we never went back. We would communicate a little bit with some people through email, like, how are things going? When we went to New Zealand, we established it with some of the people where we had email going back and forth. Oh, since you guys left, this and this was going on. But generally, we didn't have anything. See, now I talk to you on this show a few months ago. You remember, you even sent me a question for Barry Fitzgerald mm -hmm. when I had him on. What was mm -hmm. it? I think he was, I'm sorry, Barry, I got to do it to you again. He was voted like the sexiest man of the year or something one year. I mean, hey, really, buddy. there is this. There's magazines and everything that's got to put his shirt you know, off. It, it, the thing with Barry, when, when you hear him speak and you hear him the cool thing with Barry is that, and he was, there was a, a change of, you know, cast and crew. I think uh, Brandy left, Ashley left, Rob left for whatever reasons. Dustin was on board, then he wasn't, then he was. He was doing his own thing anyway. You know, he right. had family, and then I think he was probably still doing stuff with Ghost Hunters. So when we finally settled down towards the, I think, middle of season two, because it was a revolving door of cast members, they would come and go, mm -hmm. but the core groups st stayed on from the beginning from the middle of season two throughout the end. That's when they kind of, they perma partnered up and did whatever. Um, and so Barry was put in charge and everything else. Barry invited, and I'm not saying that Rob didn't or whatever, but uh, at that time I was more comfortable because I was on a show longer and I was more familiar with the inner workings of everything. But Barry very much um, invited everyone's input and invited everyone's, um, he really tackled a investigation as a team and he was really concerned for us. He was concerned for us grounding ourselves properly. He was concerned with after we were investigating, like, Oh, you may need to take a camera with your room and document stuff. And don't be afraid to contact he, and he's very well, obviously he writes books and he does lectures. Very, very well read, very well learned, very, very, um, intelligent and experienced investigator who brought a lot to the to the show and he's a really nice guy so even if i mean barry hey barry is barry hey, but, he stayed up you know, two in the morning for my hey, show <laughs> right. and if you and if you add all that stuff in of course he's sexiest man i mean mm -hmm. his mind is you know he's a great guy well i he's remember when guy. i put that up on the screen i'm like you saw like in the intro there mm -hmm. when i had that up he was just like <laughs> <laughs> what did I get myself into? Okay. Yeah. But, he's a really good guy. Really yeah, good. Yeah, he is. He, he's a really yeah. nice and intelligent guy, too. He is. But one of the things he had said was he loved doing the show. Mm -hmm. And he loved everything about the show except the traveling. Mm -hmm. He it's said tough. the traveling is what got there. It was really tough. It was really tough. And the one thing that we really like doing the show, too, is, and, and you know, I'm not bashing everyone because everyone approached it differently. But when I got on, there was a, uh, the management, the, the, producers and all that at the time they more wanted give us a show and the ghi team and again i was early on here barely i was on and then i wasn't there um they were more like no we want to investigate and i saw that there was like a little you know that kind of a head -butting. the management changed the ghost hunting team changed a little bit and then it was more like okay the 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 producers and the new management teams that came in they said okay we don't really know much about what you guys are doing, but let us know what you need to to make your jobs easier. And we're not going to tell you to fake anything. Just make it interesting for us. Give us something to work with. Like, you know, when you investigate in general, if you have a, uh, uh, what is it, a tin roof outside on your, on your house and it's mm -hmm. raining, you're going to hear that. We would have situations like that, which we knew what it was. But we would turn to each other basically and say, yo, you know what, Joe, that sounds like rain on a tin roof, but let's go check it out and make sure. Well, we're giving right. them something. Then we're walking. We're giving mm -hmm. them something. We're not lying about anything, but we are 
make it rather than instead of tagging something and dismissing it right away, we give them a little bit more. And so yeah, that's and all they require. Don't remember of those shows, and we know it because we are investigators, mm -hmm. where in that one hour show, take the commercials out, it's probably what, 37 minutes, something like that. If that, yeah. Somewhere, yeah. And three days right. we filmed inside that location. I mean, I know there's nights we used to sit inside of a room and it's like, mm -hmm. you know, two hours into this room, I'm sitting there, nothing is happening. Right. And I'm <laughs> sitting in the room by myself, starting the question, okay, what did I hit myself in the head when I was younger? Okay. What what <laughs> what, what what went wrong that I'm right. sitting here in a room, an empty room, talking to myself mm -hmm. and nothing's happening, nothing's right. what's wrong with this? Okay. Right. I mean my couch, my recliner was really nice. Okay. Why did I get <laughs> off <laughs> to, to do all of this today. So well, I, I get it is. No, it's true. Know. And and what they did, like when you were saying with the running the you know, three people running cameras or whatever, you had all of us running cameras, then you had the producer, you know, I'd have a camera or Joe would have a camera and I'd have the audio stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it was the camera filming us. So you'd have right. all our footage plus all of their footage. And you know, if they put two different episodes or two different cases in one episode, you'd have maybe twenty minutes to to capture everything so right. i didn't envy the job of the editors at all but um you certainly everything was really lost on it i mean you, you did most time nothing happens and everyone knows it. every time you go on investigation you say most likely nothing's going to happen but this is ghost hunting we can make stuff up for you you know <laughs> but i always tell even when i go with people on an investigation even if it's a charity event or some kind of an appearance i'll say listen most likely you're not going to get anything if you think you catch all these things on photos, most likely, if you let me see them, I'm going to explain away all of them. But I could lie to you, but I'm not going to do that. That's not that's not showing you anything. So you can you can go somewhere else, or you can have my method, and that's you know I'm, I'm proud of doing company, that. And I won't use the company's name. Mm -hmm. um, we were in Kentucky. I think Chip Coffee was there. We've known Chip really well, mm -hmm. and he was doing one of those celebrity ghost hunts. And we were with our friends, Elvin and Shauna, and we said, all right, let's go. You know, we had nothing else to do. We were staying there. So we went on one of these. And we were inside this one room, and this one guy is sitting there. One of the workers is sitting there with an EMF detector, K2. No, it was a K2 in his hand, and the thing's going nuts. Okay, but right behind him, you see the window there, and there's all these power lines right outside the window. So we're just sitting there. I'm not saying nothing at all. Okay. Just Elvin kept telling me, shut up, Steve. Okay. It's just hard to do. Then we <laughs> went over and there was a guy who had one of the um, the, the flare cameras, except he had okay. it on like a small one. And he's pointing and he said, see, there's like a hot spot right there. In front of him is a metal pole, a metal pipe. That's I'm not even talking painted. It's right. clear metal pipe. Okay, did he see in this on? So I had to walk away from that one because everybody was drooling over stuff. And I went over to the guy that had the the K2 in his hand. I was like, dude, you do realize that there's power line right out there, right? And he goes, yeah, I know. He said, but there's nothing else going on and the people are bored. I was like, so in other words, you're going to make up stuff instead of finding some legitimate stuff taking mm -hmm. place. And they're like, well, we're not finding any legitimate stuff, so we're making it up, making it interesting. And I'm like, but you're ruining it for people. You yeah. know, people want the real experience. Well, or, or I mean, some listen. There, I was the big. I came out years ago, and we we had a big battle back then. But Ghost Adventures and Ghost Hunters International, we were just, you know, people would always contact us on the message boards and say, "You guys suck. You don't get demons every week." Like they were serious, <laughs> but. You know, and I hated Ghost Adventures, hated it. Over the years, I've totally grown to, um, I don't like them, but I've grown to admire them a lot. And I understand the fan base they have because they're there for entertainment and sensationalism and everything. There is nothing wrong with that. But as long as people can make the differentiation between the two types of uh, shows out there, then that's fine. They weren't doing that early on. But um, I can see why it's so popular. I can see why it's still on or if it is. I don't know what's going on nowadays, all the shows. But, um, I, you know, I can understand that now. You know, one of the things when I investigated, and I'm the kind of investigator that just likes um, a basic recorder and a basic camera because 
your common sense is what needs to really, I know it sounds like it's, it's trite and it's old, but that's what needs to run an investigation. You know, so many people get involved in, and so involved in the, in the lights and the, right. And they're missing what's going on. There could be a ghost uh-huh. going right by like this and they have uh-huh. no idea. So now you I'm do always, realize someone's going to take the audio out of that and right. all they're going to find. Is- <laughs> right. So, but I, but I always, you know, I saw two things in particular. One, I was, and so I'm not really a big equipment guy. So I do understand a little bit, but I'm not really a big equipment guy. One of the things, I'll give you two examples. I was investigating somewhere. I don't even remember where this was. Midwest, I think somewhere. But years ago, this guy was using an, I think, EM, an EM pump or whatever it was at the time. So it's pumping EMF into the atmosphere. And he's got an EMF reader. And he's reading EMF fluctuations and he's freaking out. I'm like, you, like, what are you doing? That's crazy. That was one thing. And then the other time is I was at the Stanley Hotel. We were investigating. I was leading some group uh, for that. Uh, cool place, by the way. But um, we must have had a group of, I don't know. They broke up the groups into 15 or 20 maybe. And some lady brought out this device. I've never seen it before. But she sets it up. And turns it on, and right away there's lights and sounds and everything else. And I was watching it for a while, and I was watching people react to it. And I, I don't remember exactly what the situation was, but I asked her. I said, "Okay, what is this supposed to do exactly?" I, I'm not familiar with it. I'm not. I don't plan to know everything. Just tell me what it is. And so she explained what it is, and I said, "Okay, so you're using this right now." But the way you're acting with it or the, whatever else you're running with it is counteracting that. And she she did not even understand it. And then when I brought it up, she's like, I didn't even think about that. And I said, okay, that's fine. But you're part of a ghost hunting team. So you are offering your services to people. You're going to their homes and doing whatever. There's got to be some kind of culpability. here. you got to have some kind of responsibility. Um, there's got to be some kind of, you know, everyone wants to just jump out there with the equipments and get all popular and do this. You, you just have to do things responsibly because if you're having a good time or if you're looking for sound bites or video clips to put on your website, I'm not saying she was doing, I'm saying in general, you're talking to people and you're, you're going to people's homes that whatever you tell them, it's got to be as accurate as possible because some people that can shake them to their core. That could open them up to things that they never imagined. And you're telling them something that may not be accurate. You have to be, sensitive to these people that are have called you in in general because they're worried about what's going on in their home so see, is, you, you have to be responsible and you have to be really careful with stuff see that's where tim okay you know we even interviewed tim and i've known tim through you and through right. others there and tim isn't interested in that 15 minutes of fame okay and the same thing with i even with our group many people ask us like we would never heard of you before I was like, that's what we want. Right. Okay. We don't right. want to be hurt. Yeah. Okay. We we go in, we do what we gotta do. We even if we gotta go back the second time, we'll go back the second time. Mm-hmm. But we do what we gotta do quietly and go away. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't bring a camera crew in with not T V show, obviously, but yeah. camera crew so they can be the next YouTube, mm-hmm. you know, star and have you know, what happened to people's privacy at a certain point? Right. And yeah. like Tim, where you'd start to take it personally, you know. When you start to become part working with a group, you start, um, I mean, in someone's home, you start to take their um, their lives into consideration. Sure. And you want to do everything you can. As you should, as you should. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's not anymore. It's all about, they all want to be you. Well, you know what's interesting? They should want to be me anyway. Come on. No. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> no. Oh, wait a minute. But, hold on. Hold but, on. Hold on. Because there's not going to be a better place for this. Except right here. Hold on a second. Uh oh. Let's see if it shows it. Hold on a second. I may have to take us out. A second. Hold on. No. Oh. Okay. That's the, the great thing about technology. You just had that up this afternoon. What is early <laughs> right. this <laughs> you played with an app. I think that you said you want to look like a teenager. I I don't like those stupid apps. And I, I, first of all, anytime you do one, everyone and I'm not this like crazy 
conspiracy theorists, but once you do those things, they, they take all your information and you don't need that stupid. They don't even try half the time. It's just dumb. But that teenage one, I'm like, let me try it. That's kind of, that's kind of funny. Um, but no, one of the things that's interesting is I always tell people this. I said, listen, the paranormal right now, and, and this is a good time to bring it up, especially because there's like this, looks like there's this mass cancellation of shows going on right now with the paranormal stuff, the drama yeah, the more than, fear, more yeah. than normal. So mm -hmm. And not even them. Like, everyone seems to be on the chopping block for some reason. So I always tell people this. I said, at least for a long time, the paranormal stuff has been like the new kid on the block. That's the flavor of the week or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these paranormal groups that are cropping up and that are doing their thing. And so once this is not popular anymore, you're going to see the groups that are really not sincere. They're going to start falling off. And then all the good ones are going to float to the top. And you're going to see that. And now is an interesting time because I want to see when the paranormal does calm down a little bit, if it does get a reboot or, or reprieve for a little while, who still remains? And 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 it's it, it'll be really telling to see what happens. Scott, because I've seen point, groups was, come and go. There were 50 groups in Indiana where we looked, I had looked it up. And I think when we left, there was like 15. Mm -hmm. Okay, because Which is there probably still too many. <laughs> yeah, well... But they all came and gone. Right. You know, they, it was fun for a while until they realized mm -hmm. how much work it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, that was the last thing I was going to say about paranormal to you. I mean, the one thing you guys had to review your own evidence mm -hmm. like the next morning. I mean, you had to right. get it done for the reveal so you could get out of the country and go somewhere else. Right. That had to suck. Yeah. Well, generally, what we would do, is, usually after the investigation, no matter what time it was, and it was late, usually Susan would be in charge of the tapes. So she'd get all the tapes together that we ran on the DVR thing mm -hmm. um, and on that little portable DVR thing, whatever right. it was. Um, and then our camera tapes, too. And she would divvy them out to everybody. You take these, you take these, you take these. Barry would sometimes say, okay, you're going to check your audio. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And generally, what we did is we would usually have. I want to say a day off, but we'd have a day to review stuff. So we'd usually get up a little later. Sometimes um, we try to, usually we had one day off and we would try to cram something in for the day. And generally it was weird. Most of us would do stuff together. Uh, it was generally the four guys, sometimes Susan and uh, Chris are more like they'll do, they want their own time. They want to do their own thing. But once in a while they would do stuff with us, but it was pretty much the four of us doing stuff. And a lot of times Barry would say, okay, what do we want to do? Let's do something cool that's indicative of the country. Do as much as we can because we're going to do one thing. Like we were in Nicaragua. We volcano boarded. We took like it was like a big car door and we slid down an active volcano. Like you saw smoke coming. It was kind of cool um, and stuff like that. So we always tried to get something, but we still had to get our evidence. So what we would do is generally we would do that stuff, eat some food, and then we'd regroup. We'd either hang out in, in Barry's room or someone else's and we would just pop on our headphones and listen to stuff. And then we would review stuff with each other and we would make notes and we would go to the producers and say, Hey, we have this and this and this and this that we'd like to bring forward um, and have that in an interview, uh, you know, reveal type thing. And it worked. It worked very well. There was a lot of work though. That's, and I can tell you this real quick too. That's the same thing. Uh, and this may be a good segue. I don't know how you are going to do this, mm -hmm. but with the indie film stuff, you know, ghost hunting, everyone wants to do the ghost hunting. Nobody wants to do the research. Nobody wants to review evidence. It's boring. It's not fun. And their, their film is over. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. So, and then, so they don't want to go to the clients, keep, they keep the clients hanging. And it's, it's like that. Indie film is the same thing, especially nowadays. Everybody with a cell phone is a filmmaker. That's what happens. They just think they can do whatever. But, you know, when Jim and I started working together, the perfect name for us was Los Bastards because he and I, everything we everything we did got worldwide distribution, everything. And some of the people, Jim made a lot of enemies over the years because he never bit his tongue. He's just like, oh, fuck him. Excuse me. But he's like, hey, you know, it's okay. he, he would just say whatever. And, you know, he just had no filter, which is one of the reasons why I like him because he had my back. I have his all the time. Good guy. But he made a lot of enemies. And so when he started doing a lot of stuff once, he was getting all the stuff out. And someone's like, oh, that bastard Jim over here. And I'm like, that's a great name. Why don't we take that and embrace that and run with it? Because mm -hmm. we get stuff out there. And so, you know, the indie filmmakers, a lot of them, not there's a lot of them that are amazing, but there's a lot of people that call themselves filmmakers that film stuff and then they don't know what to do with it. They shelve it for years. They lose the footage. They start working on another project. We see things through from the beginning to the end because when you film a movie, that's when the work begins after the film is done. 
that's when you start doing the real work in pre-production and post-production. I know from reading all your posts and stuff, mm -hmm. um, you're going to go back and refilm something. Yeah, you for Hell's Bells, we, we had half film, the film. Yeah. Half the film we had to re we lost footage. Right. Um, it, but it happens. And, and, and I told Jim, in lesser hands, that film would have never seen the light of day. But mm -hmm. we got creative with it, and he persisted and busted his behind, and we got it done. And so that's, that's just how it is. But that's how ghost hunting has to be, too. You have to see things through from the beginning to end. You can have a good time doing it, sure. Absolutely. Why would I mean, it's a it's a very cool field. But, you know, we know this much about the whole field right now. And and it's very hum. It's very arrogant to think that people know everything. Nobody knows everything. It's also humbling to know that we really know like this much of what's out there. And so you have to approach that accordingly and research it and do whatever you can do. And, and you can come to client. And there's nothing wrong with ever telling the client, I don't know. You can say we've experienced, we've checked this, we've done as much research as we could, and we've come away with, we just don't know. That's fine, rather than giving misinformation or no information. There was one group, and I'm going to move off the paranormal. There was this one group that we went, we did an investigation at, um, and they had a group that they had filmed, you know, for their own TV type of thing, and took what they said and edited what the homeowners said for their purposes. Like they started to say, the guy said he was at Bob Mackey's, you know, so they all of a sudden were talking about that he brought a spirit back from Bob Mackey's mm -hmm. because they thought they heard somebody say one of the names from there or something like that. So they like cut up the film, you know, right. just showing, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, come on, folks. This isn't right. about doing episodes or anything like that. It's about helping people, you know. Right. So we it's only true. got into the movies. <clears throat> One thing I want, Excuse and then we'll go fall right into it. Um, I know you went through, I, I knew you then. And I knew you were going through a tough time with people accepting that you were now an actor. In making movies, I'm not a very good. Oh well, no, but funny. you know what I'm saying. I don't mean that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my God, him no. But I mean that you went from paranormal investigator to a to an acting. You know those bastards. That had to be mm -hmm. tough. It's not that it was tough. It was actually I was very well received. Um, by uh, I had a lot of support from the paranormal community, which I still do, which is awesome. And I had a lot of support from the indie uh, film community, which is awesome. The problem mm -hmm. was in my marketing of myself. You know, I, I, I started, and this is no disrespect to any of the uh, agents that I have had or managers, but I, I finally decided to forego one because I felt like I knew myself the best and I best represented myself better than any manager would or agent would. Um, that's just the way it is. So I decided to, to do that. You know, I'd rather put fate in my own hands. If I reach out to somebody and they didn't want me, that was because of my doing, not because of someone else's. Um, and so it was weird because it was a time where um, I would I looked at my my table, my merchandise table at one convention, and I'm like, well, what the hell's going on here? If I know myself, and if I came to visit this person, I'd say, who is he? I got a little bit of uh, horror stuff and paranormal stuff, and I have this. What am I? So it was hard for me to market myself because GHI wasn't really. It's still popular, and people still like it, but GHI really wasn't the 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 big draw anymore but the horror films i didn't really have enough of that under my belt to really make an impact at that time so it was weird marketing but no i was received very well by both and i still am uh, but now we're actually putting out products that people like and i'm starting to get known for some of those which is kind of helping stuff along um but it would have been easier if I was doing GHI and then I was doing the horror movies at the same time because people <laughs> right, would be yeah, snatching them up been... right at that time you know, I, I, See, I could no. I could bottle water and sell it. Now it's like, <laughs> no. See, you talked <laughs> but, about Hospital 1 and 2. Those mm -hmm. are, they were two of my favorite films that you guys mm -hmm. had done, okay? Mm -hmm. so they really did. Especially and there's still, Pittsburgh. people still talk about them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We went there, we had a great investigation. Once. Oh, yeah. So that's a great place. I want to go back there. Yeah, it's good. Um, Camp Massacre with Fat Chance. As I, I can't remember Camp Massacre. I mm. always call it Fat Chance. Fat Chance, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and that's when Jim and I were working together, even with Hospital, but he was, it was still under his former 
uh, production right. company. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And but he and I were really starting to gel at that point. So uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've been with Jim working with him for almost twelve years now. That was a good. It was a funny film, but it was a slasher film. Right. right. I mean, that's really no other way to put it. Okay, right. and those are what those films are great for. Right. Okay. I mean, they they really really were good. Mm-hmm. And then, and then you just, you guys just added to it. You added a porno actress into the mix. <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay, we can take you out here, but wait a minute, we got a new one for you. Okay, we're going to bring <laughs> Brie Olson in for this one <laughs> and stuff. And I, you know, not knocking her at all. Okay, because she seemed like really nice person mm-hmm. from what I saw in there. But I mean, that did take that to a new level. That was, again, that was all Jim and, and Daniel, um, mm-hmm. and people would ask, how did you get her? And uh, Jim always says, we asked. Yeah. You just ask. They may say no. They may say, yeah, it, it's, you know, asking, and obviously I have to probably cover their, I don't know what they really right, yeah. did. I wasn't involved with it, but yeah, and she was very nice, professional, came in, did her thing, left. Yeah. She was trying to get out, I think, from yeah, everything yeah. you read of those movies. She wanted right. to get into something different again. Right. So I and I got yeah, so she got involved with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about porn, okay? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, anyway. Then you guys went and next time I caught you was Don't Look in the Basement, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you and Jim mm-hmm. in that. Again, another laughable movie, but you know, someone's had, had, totally yeah that was someone else's yeah. totally but yeah we were yeah not. i know but i'm saying yeah you you really were starting to set the stage for mm-hmm. what you were doing but then you threw us completely to right field okay when you did night plate mm-hmm. okay you i'm sorry you took those bastards from down here and took it all the way up yeah that was our that was our official first los bastard production and in my wife's eyes as, as well as i think some other people's too that's still our um, best yeah. one. We had a good cast in that. We had the best production budget on that one. Um, and yeah, that was uh, that's a good one. It's a good film. I mean, come on. First off, you had a superstar, Scotty Rourke. <laughs> right. In the film, okay? Right. We totally Scotty. wanted him. Yeah, Scotty's a close friend of ours, too. Um, well, as you saw over there. Then you had Todd Bridges. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted Jim even when I first started meeting Jim and talking with him about stuff, I was telling him back then I wanted Todd Bridges in a movie. And he's like, I don't even know if, if he's alive, if he's at a jet, like, you know, what's, you know, whatever. What you talking about? So I, I was trying to, um, I was wooing him, I guess, for the better part of a year and his manager and everything. They could have been more professional. And uh, Todd Bridges was freaking fantastic. Great guy. Very nice. Um, it was amazing to have him on set. And uh, we had a great time. He he was he was great. He was great. It was Willis. It was awesome. One of the ta- one of the outtakes in the film is uh, one of the girls was slashed and she's laying in a hospital bed, and I'm lo- I'm leaning over looking at her, and Todd Bridges is right next to me leaning over looking at her, and both serious. And I just turn to him. I'm like, "What you talking about, detective?" <laughs> he like grabs his fake gun. He puts it up my head. It was it was a good moment. It was fun. But he's a great guy. Very nice guy. I'm gonna say, but. Even though he was good the movie, the one that took the movie was Robert Lasato. Oh yeah, yeah, he's a great guy, very uh, strong method actor, and um, very intense guy. Extremely professional, extremely intelligent. We would sit and talk for him, talk with him for you know quite a long time. I wouldn't say hours on it. We didn't have that much time on the set, but he would just very intelligent guy and very professional, very very impressive to have on the set. He. You know, when you watch the movie, nice guy. You you feel mm-hmm. his anger type mm-hmm. things at times, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, it's like, wait a minute, what am I watching? It's supposed to be a well, the, film, and it's you not. Know, Jim's been doing films for forty years, and I, in that time, Nightblade we filmed in 2015, oh, 16, 2016. I was still new to a lot of it, and. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I knew about method acting, but I've never. I don't think I've ever really been around it that much, uh, in terms of how Lasardo was. So I walked into a room, and I swear, I thought he was pissed at me. He's like staring at me. He's like, "Motherfucker!" And I was really like, "What the <laughs> hell?" Did-? He was method. He was getting ready for. And I was like, "Is this me?" And he was just ignoring me, but he was in in the zone. Getting um, in the zone. And, yep. Yep. And it was insane. 
so you guys write these movies, and before mm -hmm. I go to the other movies, mm -hmm. I don't want to pass that because I was in a question earlier <laughs> on my list here. Okay, there is a list, okay, but um, who writes? Who does most of the writing? Well, or how do you do the writing? Now I know you both guys. You're on each side of me here. I'm right in the middle of you. Okay, I got Jim. No, no. Generally, um, what we do is um now now more so I'm completely uh pretty much flying solo jim does makes no qualms about telling people he's pretty much in semi-retirement mode he's older than me he's in florida he's working in disney he's living a life but he's there for me he's a crutch he's uh, uh an advisor a friend a, an ear and he's got very good ideas and he still is in the films too um when we did cool summer he was on set for one long day but he was stunt coordinator he did all our fight choreography he was in the film as well uh but generally what we do is i'll write a script and I'll send it to him and he will from beginning to end, I'll send it to him and he'll come back and say, okay, you wrote a $500,000 script. <laughs> so this is how we're going to have to cut it back. You got to not do these and maybe focus here and do this kind of thing. Usually you have to have a kill or something in the beginning to get people's interest. It takes 50 pages until someone dies. It's too long. He'll give me that kind of advice and we'll, we'll, um, we'll amend it accordingly. When we did Nightblade, um, he actually wrote several scenes, completely he added them in he's like i think we need these um and they were very good scenes he wrote them Six in scenes that he did he actually wrote that he wrote that in. um but but the, you know, the dialogue in those scenes and the, the acting in those scenes i am i i've said this always and this is true I, i'm in awe of of jim in general his confidence you know he's a black belt in karate he's an actor he's an author he's a it's musician a i mean he, yeah. he he originally moved to Nashville because he had a contract with, I think it was Atlantic Records or something, mm -hmm. and he's on YouTube with his videos. Holy crap, the guy sounds amazing. The first time I saw amazing. that. Amazing. Now, Jim and I have been friends for probably going back to 2012, maybe even mm -hmm. earlier than that. And the first time he told me that and showed me the video, gave me the link to it, I thought it was overdubbed, something yeah. like that. No, I really he's... didn't think it was him, but it's really him. No, Plus I'm... magic. Remember, he was like right. the magician of the year. Oh, yeah. when he, was like he was like the youngest magician in the world yeah. to tour. So, so I'm I'm in awe of him. I really am. And I, the, the value that he's provided to me over the years is not only a, a, a partner in in filmmaking, but as a friend. I mean, Kim's my best friend for sure. I'm, I'm the luckiest mm -hmm. person in the world to have her. She's amazing. But Jim is my BFF outside of Kim. If they could still say that term and use that term, <laughs> he's a great guy. He's had my back for everything. He's intelligent. He gets me. I get him. I understand him. And I, like I said, I'm in awe of him because he's extremely, he's exactly what he wants to be. And you, you, you got to admire somebody that he's where he wants to be in life. If he's not, he'll get where he needs to be. Like he just does that all the time. He evolves. He does what he needs to do. And I'm in awe of that. And so to, to be able to function the way I am, I've had experience. I'm, I'm giving myself credit here, but to have someone to like that, to learn under and to be so forthcoming with stuff things. is insane. Not even that to just to, to learn so much from and to be so selfless is a, is a huge gift. And I'm, I will always be in, indebted to him. So, you know, when we still do the films now, obviously he's much less, He's very far removed. When we did Cool Summer, I don't even think he wrote, he read the damn script before he was in the film. I'm like, come on, read the script, Jim. I'm sending it to you. He's like, I don't have time. But, um, but he's there for me, which is awesome. And so, you know, we're already talking about new projects. We're going to announce one soon, uh, very soon. Um, and so he's, he's just there. And um, it means a lot to have, to have that. It I really tried does. to get him on here. And Good luck. He has no time. Like, well, yeah, he won't do it. Yes, I was no. like, but I don't really want to talk too much about Los Bastards. I was <laughs> like, you know, I really want to do it off the books and stuff. He's like, he, he Davey just says, I love you. First, he said, I would think about doing it because it's you. Right. And then the next time I asked him, he's like, to deal with Scott, because Scott does right. all my PR he, now. He can't stand doing uh, any interviews at all, and he doesn't have time. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the same thing with the films is that when we did Cool Summer, when we shot that, it, and this was uh, 2021 we shot that, he was, um, it was in the height of COVID, and we practiced all the, the protocol that we needed, but he, mm -hmm. it was at the height of COVID. Um, I think he and wife, he and his wife both have 
compromised immune systems. Still, people weren't really sure about what this thing was going. Now people get COVID. It's like, generally, it's like, oh, well, just sleep it off. And But it was really bad, like two years. We didn't know. So he wasn't sure about that. I think his and mom was living with him. His mom was living with him. And he said, you know, he's like, I've done so many of these movies over the years. And I'm kind of not, that's not my thing anymore. You know, that's, I'm not feeling that. And, you know, he's been a stunt guy for years. So he feels everything. He's told me numerous times he feels like he's got the body of an 80-year-old. So for him to get his ass out of bed and get on set somewhere, he he's really has to be physically, not physically, emotionally connected to it. So mm -hmm. I understand that. But he had my, he gave me my blessings. He was still there for what I needed. But he does take a backseat to a lot of things. And that's the same thing with the, the interview stuff. It's like his time is very, very uh, – Disney keeps him busy. And so he really doesn't have the time. And so, yeah, I, I pretty much do all the – Obviously, I have no problem talking. Kind of funny was my first thing was when we were moving here, I was like, I finally get to meet his mom. Mm. I mean, I've known his mom for years. She's mm. like, come to Nashville, stay here. And, you know, some of the premieres, you know, don't worry, just come stay at the house. And we did a website for his dad and everything else. <laughs> right. And then we get up here and she moved back. <laughs> it's like, okay, great. Okay, you heard I was coming or something. <laughs> All right, let's pick up where we left off quickly. Yeah. I did you, Truth to Dare, Part 5. Mm -hmm. Okay, how did you get? How did that come about for you? One of the books I wrote that you had in the beginning, um, I talked about some of the overlooked horror films of the years, mm -hmm. uh, over the years. And we're this get is most, you. yeah, this is mostly for um, general audiences, not horror fans, but some people that just casual viewers. And one of the films I mentioned was Truth to Dare: Critical Madness. I grew up with this horror film; I loved it. Saw it on shelves over the years. Never had a VCR. Finally got one. Rented the film and loved it. And the director Tim Ritter had become one of my childhood idol directors. And so I caught, I found Tim was on Facebook, as everybody is. I reached out to him one day, never met the guy, and said, hey, I wrote a book. You're a huge influence to me. You've been, you know, so important over the years. I've mentioned Truth or Dare. Thank you, whatever. And he's like, he was so nice. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to come visit you. Where are you going to be? I'm like, no, you don't. You know, I'm going to be at this convention. He's like, I'll may maybe I'll show up there. I'm like, that's just being nice, you know. He showed up. He showed up. He wanted to buy a book. I'm like, no, take a please take a book. And he and I really hit it off. And he had made several sequels over the year to the film, all diminishing in budgets. Um, and they were almost they looked so properish. You know, they were filmed on video or something, and they, they didn't really capture the essence of the first film. And I said, you know, you really need to make a, another one. It would be a part five, but you really need to make one. And he was very hesitant about it because I think part four was difficult to shoot for whatever reasons. And Finally, I think I sparked the fire on him because he contacted me a short time after and said, Scott, I want to let you know you got the ball rolling in my head. I want to do part five, and I'd love for you to come on board as, as the producer. You're doing all the stuff. And it's a, and I was honored. I'm like, me? You know, are you kidding me? And then we kept talking, kept talking, and he just started saying, I want you to star in it. I want you to co-direct it with me. And I was just like, you're like a childhood <laughs> idol of mine. This is This is insane. And so we did that. Unfortunately, the, the budget was not literally non-existent. And um, the film definitely suffered because of that. So he and I are, and it was fun. I mean, people liked it. But he and I, um, being both, I would say consummate professionals, but, you know, being film uh, somewhat perfectionists, we both want to revisit it and recut it and re, re, uh, release it, re-release it. And we're probably going to be doing that some point this year um, and, you know, polish it up a bit. Okay, now you showed your rock and roll talents <laughs> <laughs> with Hell's Bells. Right. And folks, we're not talking about the ACDC song. We're talking about the movie, Hell's right. Bells. <clears throat> okay, I, I understand that, you know, uh, CBD oil and all that Delta 8 is all legal here now in Florida. But, okay, where did this come about? <laughs> Um, it's a typical Devil and, Dev, Dan, Devil and Daniel Webster story. Uh, mm -hmm. It's basically about two aging rock and roll uh, losers that have like a garage band and work as like part-time uh, grocery baggers that dream of becoming rock stars. And they meet some guy on the street who literally walks up to him in a park lot and says, I want to be your manager. And we're like, okay. And we're like burnouts and uh, find out. Oh, all our people, all the people we know start dying. And we find out that uh, the guy basically sold our souls to the devil, who was played by Mark Skippy Price, Skippy from Family Ties. Mm -hmm. Yes, we got him on board. And um, and we're just like two burnouts. And that was the film that we did that to this uh, right now, everyone is saying they love this film. It's, it's like their favorite movie. A lot of people swear up and down by Hell's Bells. And 
it to be, be honest, it's 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 awful. It's it's so funny, it's so stupid, but it connects with people. They like it, and that was the thing that we lost footage on. We had to refilm, and when we did. I had lost forty pounds between <laughs> when we first filmed it and we picked up the scene. So there's one scene where I leave a car heavy. I walk into a room and I'm thin. We just <laughs> left it. It's so, but we break the fourth. But we talk to the camera in the film. People like the movie. It's funny and it's on Tubi. It's free. So is Nightblade, by the way. If anyone wants to check it out, they're both I fun. I have both of them on DVD. So <laughs> they're fun. I they're mean, fun literally, good. You know, we'll talk about some of the Paracons. I'll let you talk about any of these films you want. Because this is outside of Los Bastards, Creepy Crawly, Southwest, Hybrid, Paranormalous, that's how it's pronounced, The Crocodile Chronicles, Kill, Kill Devil, Mutants, Meat Hook, Massacre 4, Graveyard Stories 2, Death Care, and Grim Reaper Part 2. Okay, and um, but there's probably more, okay, that <laughs> I didn't get there. You've stayed busy. Yeah, oh, I Once like those kind of films. You, you don't give it up. I like those kind of films, so I'm like, yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. I'll I'll do this. Um, and what I what I tried to do to start building some of my arsenals, I would literally, especially early on, I would start contacting people when GHI was on, and I said, listen, I want to get into this uh, indie film industry. Um, I did have some kind of name recognition back then because of Ghost Hunters. And I said, if you want someone with somewhat of a name attached to your project. Let me do it. I'll come in. Uh, you don't have to pay, pay me. Just let me get in. And it's a small community. So word spread that I, I was easy to work with. I guess I wasn't a horrible actor. Um, and so I, start, so I started getting more and more work. And so I, but I love doing these films. I have a huge soft spot in my heart for them. I collect them. That's my thing. And so like I'll give you an example. I don't even do short films, but Creepy Crawly and um, Kill Devil is from Robert Massetti and Jason Daly. And they, those guys are, uh, they're part of the uh, I think it's Fear uh, Film, Fear Film, Fear Film uh, Company. I can't remember the name right now. I'm drawing a blank. I can't believe it. I know who they are, and I'm just drawing a blank. But they were part of Spooky Empire, and then they broke out, and they have their own thing now. Uh, and they've been doing it, and they're successful. Very nice guys, and their films are quality. So uh, Creepy Crawly is a great, great short about this like spider creature um, loose in his house. It's a great film, very good production values, and then. Um, it was funny when we did that. We shot that in, I think, two, one day, uh, the whole thing. And they also shot it again. Instead of dubbing it, they shot it in uh, in Spanish with a whole Spanish cast. So we did our film, and then the Spanish cast came in and did and the did exact the same film in Spanish. The guy, yeah, the guy that they had me to had play me, he comes in. He's this big, tall, muscular Spanish guy with long hair. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, how was how that even remotely? Like me, so we took a picture together, which is somewhere on Facebook. But um, those guys are good guys, and you know I like doing a lot of these films too because you make friendships that that last. I mean, I did Cindy Sydney Cindy Crotz was in um was in uh, Creepy Crawly as well. She's great. Um, and there's I made a lot of friends, and they're, we're still friends. And um, it's an honor to know have these people and to work with them. These some of these guys are great. They're absolutely amazing. Now to stick with consistency with the show. Overlooked and underrated, mm -hmm. parts one and two. Okay, what made you? You talked about it earlier, but what made you decide to write those? For for people that are listening, first off, explain what the book is. Each of one of the books are. Yeah, they're they're basically horror review books of films that have just been overlooked and uh, passed passed over on the shelves mm -hmm. years ago. People would see them on video store racks, but never rented them. And a lot of these films were. You know, in the, in the heyday of VHS and Betamax, what was cool with those cheap, cheap, cheap films is that it, it leveled the playing field for people because you would have million dollar features on a shelf and right next to it, something that cost you know thousand dollars was taking up the same shelf space, had the same chance of being rented. They were right next to each other. And, and you know, that was the real the real the realty right there. And it was valuable um, property to have real estate. And, you know, that's why they some companies opted to put out movies on bigger boxes, which are known as clamshells or big box tapes, because it took up more room. So it was more eye catching, but it leveled the playing field. The problem is a lot of these films over the years, when everything switched to DVD or digital or whatever, they were such a small production that they were never picked up by anybody else. 
And so they fell through the cracks because people didn't pay to license them. They weren't, they didn't see the value in them and they're still out there. And some of them are great films are very enjoyable, but they were never given a, uh, you know, they were never given a rebirth on another format. And so I was trying to, some of them have now since come out, since I made the book, they're on DVD or Blu-ray or both. But um, a lot of these films just been forgotten about and they're great. I wanted to draw attention to them. And so I did a book for a hundred films and then I did another, another hundred. See, growing up with my friends in my early 20s and stuff, we used to mm-hmm. hang out like on a Saturday night, get a case of beer and stuff. And we used to watch, go down to the video store and pull these obscure titles right. no one's ever heard of. Mm-hmm. And I can't even remember the names of, with the exception of Faces of Death, those right. films, which I swore I would never show up in any place I ever lived again. But right. um, I, I have too many vivid memories of a monkey. In the table, okay. So <laughs> when, when the woman ate the ate the Lucky break, that was it. I, yeah. It was off. I threw everybody out. That was in my house. Told them to take the video with them, and that was it. Um, but we used to watch films like that, and yeah. used to love those films. This, um, you know, it's probably why I can get into a lot of the films, the earlier films, especially that you guys made. Mm-hmm. Because it was those little campy slashing films mm-hmm. that were so unique and so part of our culture mm-hmm. that just seems now, unless it's that, you know, Wes Craven multi million dollar blockbuster, you know, you don't see it anymore. Right. Right. Yeah, so, and it, it's Hollywood doesn't take chances. They they know what is it sells for them. So they and I'm a I'm the number one obviously I love sequels. That's my thing. I like mm-hmm. most sequels better than the originals, but Hollywood is bankrupt of ideas. They, they just want to redo everything, either add a, a, a number after a, uh, an established property already or reno- rename it all together and just put the same film out. And it's sad because indie film, there's so much creativity there, but there's no money to be made. So no one's interested in backing these films. And so these are probably films are going to fall through the cracks and, you know, end up dead by the way, <laughs> you know, dead on the side of the road as well. That's just what happens. See, now you did Magnetic Highway, mm-hmm. and I love Exit, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Didn't catch that to the other day when I was right. doing that, that that little intro there, mm-hmm. Exit 2. But you actually documented the video stores and how they're sort of making a little bit of a resurgence today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I went uh, to the road trip up the East Coast and hit all these video stores that are still in, um, in business. And a lot of them have evolved into, like, tanning salons for some reason. And video stores or pizza places and video stores, mm-hmm. but it works and they keep the lights on and they do their business because there's still there's still a very big market for physical media. You cannot get what you you know. I think it's like sixty maybe more percent of everything that was released physically is still not made it uh, to streaming or even to DVD. A mm-hmm. lot of them are just still on v- VHS or Betamax um, for reasons that I brought up before, and so um, people are seeing that need they're seeing that void and now there's a nostalgia out there as well that's helping fuel these um these uh, needs for people and so yeah i, I think uh, there was an article that came out the other day about blockbuster being res- being research uh, resurgent uh, blockbuster and uh their twitter account is now active after years and there's talk that they may be coming back i think they're going to be coming back like toys r us is right now like doing little test models markets in different corners of department stores and maybe offering a streaming thing or some kind of blu-rays maybe but we'll see we'll see what happens with that um the story also turned out to be erroneous because um they they were saying that they were announcing five new locations that's not the case that's not happening right now i believe within two years there'll be physical brick and mortar video stores coming back that's my opinion um but i do think blockbuster is up to something you talk about that there's a lot of people that collect and stuff. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about behind you right now. <laughs> okay, because right now you're sitting in front of some of my favorite shows, The Honeymooners. Yep. And I don't know, maybe that's something because we were in New York. I never thought about that. The bus driver, mm-hmm. you know, I bribe a dust, you know, that guy, you know, <laughs> from, from there. So, you know, I mean, we had WPIX, remember mm-hmm. Channel 11 in New York. Right. That ran them all the time. They still do the marathon. If I get lucky, I'll catch somebody here, you know, one of the uh, stations running it. Mm-hmm. But I have, like, what you have up in that corner there, the honeymooners box there mm-hmm. with, you know, the, the collector set. Mm-hmm. And I did watch actually about a week ago. For the first time, I had never seen it. 
was the Valentine. Okay, yeah. Episode. Mm -hmm. I had never seen that before. Mm -hmm. And that was really cool. It was on YouTube, I think, is where I found that one. I, I'm not even going to ask, how did you get into the Honeymooners or why? Because I know why. I mean, yeah. come on, okay? They're classic yeah. in itself. But how far have you gone? Um, I mean, look behind you, okay? It shows part of how far you've gone. Yeah, it's... it's, um, it's You're sitting in Honeymooners Corner. Okay? Yeah, it's kind of like all all over the place. Cha this is my Chauncey Street corner. That's what I call it. Um, yeah. I'm, a huge, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of that time. Everything was, it was an innocent time. Um, Jackie Gleason himself asked years ago, why is the honeymoon, why, why is the honeymoon is endured? And he just said, it's funny. It's, it's funny. It's not, it's not topical. It's not political. It's just funny. And I mean, there's just humor. People are, you know, people don't even picture some of the sociological, uh, impacts that it had as well. Like the, um, you know, a lot of people read into, don't read into this, but Ralph Cramden, they were crammed into a small apartment. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's a lot of different things to read into that show, but um, I just, I'm in awe of Jackie Gleason in general. Um, he's just, I mean, that, I've just, seen so uh, many talk about on him. immense talent. Um, mm -hmm. He, especially when you see the, the latter episodes when it was basically the Jackie Gleason show and it was, they were all color episodes and he moved to Miami. I've never seen a more, happy fulfilled person with their life ever and it's very inspiring and it's genius and came from a rough rough uh, childhood but survived and that transpired through you know all all of that is is evident through his work um and he he knew what he wanted he went to go for it and he's very inspiring and and just i love jackie gleason oh, and honey is fantastic I have it, him. yeah, I have it, I have it on Blu-ray yeah. and and well, um, yeah, video. Well, yeah, he talks about there. They whoever it was asked him why he went to down to Florida, Miami mm -hmm. Beach, and he said because I could. Right. He right. said, you know, I was that popular and that big right. that the network could do whatever I wanted to do. Right. He said, so I went down there. Now I don't want to miss and forget. I got a question <laughs> on YouTube. Where it says, who's your favorite horror director? My favorite horror director is David Cronenberg. Um, he's had a shaky filmography over the years. He's starting to come back and do some solid horror as of late. But um, uh, Rabid, The Brood, uh, they uh, um, Shivers, I'll go with that, use that name for it. Shivers, Scanners, all those movies made him like pretty much solidified him. Videodrome, those all solidified him as an uh, amazing director. And I just love his work. He's just the best. And there's a ton of, you know, horror actors, a ton of horror directors that I like, but I really do. Um, he's like my number one, for sure. Well, I hope, Davey, I hope that answered your question, because Davey Jones locker there. Um, I want, I got two more questions for you. <laughs> we'll wrap up, because we've been going here. No worries. Um, you know, you obviously, I have no problem talking. I'll go and go and go. My wife's yeah, probably well, like, okay. right, wrap it up. I haven't talked to you in a long time. So right, I, right, exactly. you know, I, I'll keep going. <laughs> right. How did you meet Kim? We actually met online. We met online. Um, and we. it's interesting because she had attended, and I didn't know this, I think for a little while, I, I wasn't aware of this, but she had attended a ghost hunt seminar type thing that I was either part of, I was never really hosting it, but I think that I was part of in Georgia years back. I think she met me a year or so before we actually uh, got together. And I don't think she realized that at first either. It was kind of interesting, but uh, she had been interested in that as well. But yeah, we just met online and, and seriously, she's the best thing in my life. Uh, I'm crazy about her and Ashley and now our two crazy chihuahuas. Yes, could be happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a. They sort of follow me. I got the Chihuahua here and the two <laughs> Shelties just right. laying on the floor right here. I always nice. pray that no one comes to the door or no one makes a noise and they start talking. <laughs> right. Because, yeah, they will just start off right away. And I mean, I've seen the change in you since mm -hmm. you've been with her. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're much, much happier. Mm -hmm. And you've actually put them in your movies. <laughs> 
So Kim, she supports everything, but she's so uninterested in being in the films. And Ashley is less interested. But finally, Kim Kim said, why don't you just put me in a film? I finally, kill me off in a movie. I want to die in a movie, and I don't want to have any dialogue. And so I did that in Cool Summer. Mm-hmm. Not much dialogue at all. She's mostly like, and she gets killed. And she still is like, no, nah, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Well, talk about that before we, um, before I ask you your last <laughs> question. Sure. The movie's coming out. It's actually, people have gotten mm-hmm. copies of it. You've mm-hmm. actually done the premiere of it, if I'm correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Talked about the movie and where someone can buy it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Cool Summer and Cool Summer 2. And it looks like they're getting a, a one-two punch. Uh, they're coming out through Screen Team Releasing, which is a really good um, horror uh, distributor, which I'm very excited about. They have awesome cover art. That's all of my Facebook page. You'll see it. Um, the people that got their Blu-rays and DVDs were our Indiegogo supporters. They made the movie happen. So they got the discs first with different cover art and different. There's a bonus feature on each one that's different than what will be on the official release. It was just exclusive to them as a thank you for helping us get the film made. But um, yeah, they're, they're basically homages to the typical 80s slasher, which is my favorite films. Um, and what I did was I made them love letters to longtime fans of these kinds of films because every character is named after either a horror icon or horror character, uh, every or actor. Um, every location is referenced uh, from another horror film. Every there's bits of dialogue that are peppered in that are from other more uh, either more known or lesser known horror films. But it's a uh, it's almost like a um, uh, it's filled with Easter eggs for people. And then I did the same thing with sequel. It's called sequel. Cool summer part two. Um, same thing with that. And what is going on is they're both being released uh, at the same time, but on separate releases, like two different discs, two whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, they're going to come out the end of April, early May. I don't have I don't have official dates just yet, but they're on their way. They're going to be loaded with bonus features. And one of the things I wanted in my contract that they were very happy to oblige me with is uh, they're both going to be on VHS as well. This is the kind of film that plays like an old time '80s slasher film. Why wouldn't I have it on VHS? Especially since I I own like. <laughs> thousands of yes, horror uh, films. See, people so, don't realize if you're watching this for the first time and really have only seen Scott on TV and don't know, he's sitting in, what's the size of the room that you're in? It's not a big room. It's just packed with movies. Yeah, I, I mean, literally wall to wall. Like, you see the cabinets behind them. I mean, they I go can... up even higher. There he goes. See <laughs> what talking about? It's a... It's all over. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's, and he's got... TVs in there, the old box TVs <laughs> that is in there with VHS. There's a TV, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, we used to joke, I used to joke with you a lot when I, before I retired, it's like, you know, it was people like you that had those VHS tapes that kept me in business. Because right. we used to convert them to sure. DVD and stuff for them now. But right, I do exactly. agree with you that I have found myself looking at the covers mm-hmm. of certain VHS tapes Mm-hmm. And there's just so much more on a cover than this well, little. DVD. They had no, they had no internet, so that was mm-hmm. the, their marketing, their strategy. And sometimes they right. were, a lot of times they were wildly inaccurate on purpose. Um, the art was to get you to watch clearly, it, yeah. you know, just it, it, flat out lie on these covers. <laughs> but um, it's the charm about them. It's awesome, and that's what that's what sold the movies. So um, yeah, it, it's and a lot of these films too, they look better on. I mean, no one will. People like vinyl. And they'll, they, they sound better than CDs. CDs sound more tinny, hollow. You know, the, the vinyl sounds deeper and richer. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to argue. Right. But nobody's going to argue that VHS looks better than Blu-ray or anything. It doesn't. But it works better for a lot of films. Because I would definitely rather watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre or, or Exorcist on a grainy, washed-out videotape with a few lines that come through it. It's creepy and atmospheric. If you see it redone, a lot of them are mastered the wrong way. And people that do it take the liberty of color coding it the way they want or changing the director's vision or even sometimes the music is different or certain things don't quite make the proper transfer over from VHS. And VHS is it's, – it's really adds a lot to watch these films. It washed out and as crappy as they may look, it adds atmosphere. And they, they actually look better. I would challenge anybody out there, take, take, take on Night of the Living Dead. The original. Watch that on a on a washed out VHS tape. 
and then pop in a 4K restoration, uh, restored version, the black and white one on the VHS tape will stick with you probably more than the other one. And it looks great on this restoration stuff that they have, but um, or Criterion Club, whatever it is. Um, but the VHS, it, it's a different experience. I think Dugan would agree with you. John. <laughs> I actually talked to him the other night. I was talking to him the other night on the phone. He's but the guy. last time I had seen you, I walked right by him three times, not even <laughs> know who he was. Okay, He's great because I hadn't seen him in so long. Right. And stuff that you know, was more like bugging Joe the whole night that was there. <laughs> um, you, you said something about soundtrack. You write most of the music. And stuff that that's on some of these soundtracks. It's some. Um, it's not. You know. It's basically for lack of budget. Um, I'll mm -hmm. sit around and I, a lot of times I just got a an old, but it, well, not that old, but it's for music. I guess music terms nowadays, it's old. But this big ass Roland keyboard something. But I, a lot of the stuff I was doing was online synthesizer stuff, um, and I was just doing that just to, you know, get some notes that I'd like. I'd repeat a few things here and there, that kind of thing. Generally, I would get people to get music for us, donate music for us. Um, we credit them accordingly. A few people we've paid and we've had them release the rights to the music that we now own it. Um, it's a lot of things we did, but um, yeah, out of necessity, I was In fact, able I think to. It was, I don't remember that. what movie it was, but I remember Jim, I had uploaded a bunch of songs for Jim to hear. Mm -hmm. And I think he was going to just use those recordings. And he says, these are great, but you got to re-record them. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you smoking? Okay. <laughs> I mean, those were done like in the 80s, okay, in the right. 90s. You, right. I don't even know if my voice can hit some of those notes anymore. <laughs> you want me to hit, oh, we need to re record them. No, it was a disaster in that. Okay, <laughs> so we, we've seen all basically about Scott Tepperman. Now, you, you've done guest judging for film festivals. I know around you've been Paracons. It's basically throughout the world. Because haven't you done a couple of shows of Paracons outside the country? Uh, I didn't do a Paracon. I did a HorrorCon. They brought a Jim Horror and I out to, right, yeah. to Germany. Yeah, they brought Jim mm -hmm. and I out to Germany. We were with Don the Dragon Wilson, Fred Williamson, Brian Krause, and uh, I don't know who the hell else we were with. Um, we had a great time. We, had, we, had, we were treated like gold, and we received very well. We had a very good time. Oh, and we, we sat next to the, the drummer for ACDC the entire week, and that was our booth go. mate. We're like, uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, but, well, yeah, it was cool. So what's, so what's next for Scott Tepperman? Uh, we have uh, another film we're going to announce in about – as soon as they announce the official date for Cool Summer and Cool Summer 2, we're going to go ahead and um, announce the next project. But we still have things in a pipeline. We have two or three projects mm -hmm. that we're thinking about doing i have some uh finally have some events coming up um I actually tell us have about a, the events we'll Which have event? a vhs festival coming up in two weeks uh in mm -hmm. tampa it's uh it's out it's outside and it's a bunch of trading yeah, it's not that far away from me no so it's, a, it's a cool time we did a couple hours we do it it's going to be outside so we're not going to be out there all day but uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun we're going to do that the following week i'm going to tampa bay screams my friend sean donahue in tampa runs that uh, it's a cool horror convention. He's going to have some good guests. It's always a good show. A lot of good people and a lot of good local talent. I'm going to go down and support him and see everybody. Um, and then I have um, – I'm still in the middle of processing a bunch of different projects coming up, but some paranormal ones coming up too. There's one in June. I may be going to Silcon in uh, – um, I think it's September. I'm still talking to them about that. Uh, we have some some events coming up. Should and, there, and there may be another one coming up in uh, – I think it's South Carolina or North Carolina maybe coming up also. Good on the men's field. What's the mm -hmm. one? There? I was only there one time. It's a cool place. Yeah. Ohio. And we we fingers crossed right now. We we have a booth there. We plan on going back for that. Okay. Okay. See the big problem becomes with oxygen with me, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to transport tons of tanks. Right. You know, with me and that that becomes a problem. Sure. So but at least there I can actually set up my Concentrator, and I don't have to bring all those tanks. Right, and you, you can know, just sit down and stay yeah. stationary. You don't, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's going to be doing some readings and stuff. Right, so, right, exactly. You know, it'd be nice to see some people, you know, like Tina Marie and mm -hmm. her husband Tim. She's who great, I haven't yeah. seen in a long time. So, right, you know, it's a good way to meet back with some people we haven't seen in a bit, you know, mm -hmm. and just hang out with them. So, Scott, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Don't go anywhere yeah. when the show's over, okay? Because <laughs> I want to talk to you. But for people that are listening here, next week we have on the sixth, Tia McGriff. 
Now, that's part of our music series. Um, I'm going to read you a, because you want to say country right away, but she's not. It's Americana, bluegrass, Celtic, folk. She's a songwriter and a musician. I've heard a lot of her music. I've been listening to it. It's really, really good stuff. So we'll be talking to her, and I believe it's her husband. Uh, on the 13th, we have Chris Maggot, who's going to be with us. And I think you know Chris. Don't I know. I, I think I met him once or so, okay, yeah. but I know who he is. Chris is a producer, director, writer. He's a filmmaker and stuff. He's a really nice guy. Okay, I've, I've met him. And there are a number of good people coming up. We're just trying to book some the dates, agreeing on dates <laughs> for shows, because sometimes that's not not that easy. So, um, you know, stick with us. We're back now. I hope to have a show every Thursday night. We might also do a couple of shows like about are we living in a simulation theory or did we really land on the moon? I have some information both sides of that coin. Okay, why we did and others saying why there was no way we could have. So all those stories are interesting and, you know, we want to give something good. So thank you for joining us tonight. And Scott, thank you for coming on. That was awesome. And thank what, you. Where do they find out about you? What's that? What's your website? Just go to, um, just go to find me on Facebook, Scott Tepperman, uh, or Scott GHI, whatever it is. Twitter, Scott GHI. I'm on TikTok and Instagram. I think it's all the same somewhere. And just, you'll find me on there for sure. You, Scott but, dash Tepperman. Uh, ScottDashTepperman.com is my website, but you know, reach mm -hmm. out to me. I don't, I don't just want people on the page. I actually interact with people, so I invite right. being, you know, getting messages, shooting ideas back and forth, connecting with people. I like that. So yeah, absolutely hit me up, and I'm available for events and surprisingly cheap, very cheap. So hit me up. I'm a and good he's guest. A good person I'm a good to lecturer. Have there. Yeah, I can tell you uh, from the times I've seen him there, people, even other vendors, draw around you. And when they reason. all start to draw around you, everybody else wants to know what's going on what's at that going table. On. Yep, exactly. and that's that's a great thing. It's not like Santiago; you don't have to scream across the room. And we know well, you're you there. know, you will have to scream when he's there. You, <laughs> make make sure people hear you. But I had him on this show, and the first guy. thing I told him before we went on the air was Hiya! like, "My eardrums don't <laughs> scream." <laughs> so, all right, folks, thanks for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you next week.